I'm Brian Vans, WorldbikeDragQ.com, and today we're going to break down our Vortex EK3D GP chain kit install on our 2018 Suzuki GSXR 1000R M4X Star Team replica project bike. Okay, so one of the real benefits of doing this project with our race team partner, M4X Star Suzuki, is being able to get actual information and data from the race team directly and do some of the things to this bike that they're doing to the race bike that Jake Lewis is on. So, chain and sprockets. Vortex is a race team partner, one of our big partners here at STG2. They make a lot of great stuff. Famous for sprockets, no question. They're now the North American distributor for EK Chains. For the last several seasons now, EK has had this 3D chain available. This is a high-end chain. It's also very light. They've gone through great lengths to develop something that is strong and lightweight, so you have less weight, less friction, okay? And remember, this is all rotating mass too, so it's amplified as the wheel is spinning, as everything is turning. Stock chain kit, the gearing is 1745, Motorcycle comes with a 525 chain on it. I've ridden it a couple of times with that, so now I know what that feels like. Gearing. I was advised by Chris Ulrich, team owner, to go with a 16 tooth front and a 41 tooth rear. So I will be at certain places I'll be using first gear. He's like, yes, go ahead and use first gear. We're actually going to be just a little bit taller than OEM with this. 118 links is what we have in the chain right now. The weight of this chain kit is 2.15 pounds less than that OE kit. That's actually quite a bit. And even more than that too, remember, it's getting that proper gear ratio that's going to work good on this bike and it's nice to get the feedback from the team. Wheelbase length. The 118 links with the 41 tooth rear sprocket puts this back in the swing arm and they said they've got their best performance, their best handling from it being further back in the swing arm. That's pretty typical on a 1,000cc bike. You wanna try and lengthen it out just a little bit to help keep that front wheel down, okay? With the 16 tooth front and 118 link chain, you would be able to use a 41 tooth rear, a 42 tooth, or a 43 tooth rear sprocket, all with the same 118 links. Front sprocket is just the Vortex Steel 520. Rear sprocket is their hard coat rear. Team has found those hold up the best. And we want that long life as well as good performance. And in testing too, and they, they went through multiple chains before they found the one they were happiest with, which is this model. Been reported long life, very low stretch. And realistically, when you're out there racing, the last thing you want to do is have issues with something that is as basic as your drive line. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive into the full install for this. Once again, these are the same exact parts that are being used by Team M4 X-Star Suzuki on that 1000 bike. We're also using the same gearing. Stock is 1745. From Chris Ulrich, I got the gearing that they've really had a lot of success with at most tracks, with Road America as an exception to this, because it's a unique track. If you've been there, you know that. We're gonna go down one in the front, 16. Now in the rear, we are going to go down four from the 45 to a 41. We're also changing over to 520, so there'll be a, a weight savings. Over the last couple of seasons with this bike, they've experimented using some different EK chains. Vortex is now the EK chain distributor for North America. And after testing, they landed on this 3D GP chain. And we're gonna use the same exact chain and sprockets they're using on that superbike. So jumping into the install right now. First thing I wanna do is I wanna deal with that counter shaft sprocket nut. In order to do that, we have to get access to it. Go ahead and take the shift knuckle off so we can remove the cover. You wanna try and pay attention to the orientation of that. Make sure that we're gonna land back in the same place, avoid any adjustments. You 
you know, this whole 1641 deal, I'll be honest with you, when Chris recommended this, I'm like, really? Because that's against what you would normally do, okay? Most oftentimes, you're going to take and you're going to shorten the gearing up. It's going to give the bike, you know, more perceived drive out of the corner, okay? That is, that is the most typical gearing change that you'll find and that you'll most often do. Our final result here, okay, we're going down one in the front, and that's basically almost three teeth in the rear, right? But we're also taking four teeth off in the back. So our net change when we're done is going to be one tooth taller than stock. Of course, then that you know brought another question for me. I'm like, because after riding the bike already at Grattan. I felt like, you know, coming out of places like the bus stop in second gear, I'm like, man, it just kind of was lugging a little bit. So I asked him, I'm like, are you guys using first? And he's like, yes, Jake is using first gear quite often. So we are making the same change that they're using right now. This should be pretty interesting. Hopefully I get a chance to kind of test this tomorrow. I'll let that hang there. Let's see what size socket we have. Okay, that is a 36 mil up front. Hopefully you have that in your toolbox as well. Right now what I want to try and do is I want to just get this out of the way and hold it there. Okay, I know that looks ghetto, I get that, but it serves its purpose. Just got it hanging out of the way so we got all the pressure off the harness while we're doing the job. 36 mil socket on your counter shaft nut here. You can see that definitely it's going to touch that coolant hose, so I want you to be cognizant of that. If you're an impact user and you want to use an impact to remove this, think about it, okay? Maybe hold the hose out of the way before you wrap that thing off there. If you're going to use the old trusted breaker bar method, okay, it's, you don't have to worry about it quite as much. Maybe block the rear wheel, okay, with a pry bar or something. I've shown you that stuff before. And then use the ratchet up here to break it loose. You know, either way, just make sure you're cognizant of that hose before you jump into it. Okay, I'm going impact, man. Fortunately, I've broken it loose enough that now that Pirelli slick, and yes, Pirelli has that much grip. That's how much grip Pirelli has. It's sitting on the table. You can see I'm definitely putting some effort behind this, and it won't spin. Think about that next time you're looking to buy a slick. Okay, just about got that. The nut they're using on this is a locking nut and there is also as you can see the thread locker coming off this thing right now okay that is absolutely something you don't ever want to come loose nut washer okay you're going to save all that now we need to break the chain so we can get it off a lot of different ways to do this too as always we're going to use our motion pro pbr tool we're going to break the chain using this Phenomenal tool, one of my favorites. So we have, if you look at this, we're going to show you this again. If you want to break it, you need to line the B up with the brake rivet right here. Lock that into position. Okay, and then this is the pin that's going to actually break the rivet and that allows it to push into that block okay this is really simple stuff really enjoy using this tool it's a great tool line that up back that worm screw out you want to make sure this thing is lubricated too this one's got a pretty good amount of lubrication still on it so i'm backing that drive pin out enough seating that like so and then run that down got a 17 and a 14 mil wrench. The 17 is used to hold the larger portion of the drive screw. And here's our breaker pin. This works really well. You can use a die grinder if you prefer to. A lot of different ways to get this done. But you'll see right now, this is just gonna bust that super easy. Yeah, 
Now this is our currently our number one selling chain tool and it has earned that right, that top slot, which is a lot of great performance. This is the same tool I've been using for the last couple seasons on all these chain videos we've done, and we've done a ton. With this, we're going from 525 stock down to 520. There's gonna be a weight savings. The stock chain on this motorcycle is 120 links. The chain that we have here, which I'm most likely going to have to cut only because of the gearing choice I've made, is 120 links. We've weighed that, and we're going to weigh this stock set up here when I remove it and try and get you all an idea of what the weight savings would look like when you're swapping to this kit from the OE kit. I bet you the chain alone weighs as much as the entire kit we're about to put on. Okay, time to pull the rear wheel off so we can get the sprocket off the carrier. Got a pit bull stand, pit bull pit crew tire wedge. Gonna hold this bad boy up here in position. Just put a little bit of pressure up on it there. Got my ratchet, 36 mil axle socket. Same one that we used on that counter shaft. through. Okay, remember you've got your ABS speed sensor. Your wheel speed sensor is down here, so you want to be really super careful. So you notice I'm adjusting that tire wedge down a little bit right now. I'm keeping an eye on that. The wedge is all the way down. And that's just going to get me the room I need to get the caliper off without touching the end of that sensor at all. Cut me a little slack, that's the first time I pulled this wheel off, but the sensor's right down here, and what you don't want to do is have a lot of hard contact against the rotor or the spacer for the wheel and damage it. You do that, it's not going to work. You're going to lose the benefit of your electronics. I'll use the tire wedge again once I have everything in a position just to hold it there. From here, go ahead and roll your wheel out and we'll be ready to change that rear sprocket. Okay, rear sprocket. Got a 14. Pretty basic stuff here. We're going to reuse, obviously, all the stock sprocket nuts. These are locking nuts, just like we find on the axle, and we also find on that counter shaft. When you're doing a chain kit like this, too, it's always a nice opportunity to clean up some stuff that's hard to reach without having the bike all disassembled. So we'll take advantage of that. Clean the wheel, cush drive, all that kind of stuff a little bit. Even though it's a new bike, it's starting to get a little dirty. It's freaking me out. Get it nice and clean. Yeah, that is definitely a lot heavier than that hard coat Vortex. Okay, so notice that clean wheel. Gotta love Maxima SC1. Inside of the swing arm, swing arm. And you got to get back in here. That was nasty. Clean this. I'm not sure if I'm going to put it back on, but I cleaned it. And then I SC1 everything, too, because that helps prevent stuff from sticking to it. Okay. Now, get that Vortex Hard Coat 41 tooth 520 rear on there. Weight difference. 2.15 pounds from that stock 525 down to this 520 kit. 
2.15 pounds. Remember, that's rotating mass too, so that's pretty significant stuff. And it's nice to see that. All right, get all those down there finger tight. Just get them all seated before you apply any final torque. Like so. If you prefer to use a torque wrench, now's a good time to go grab it. I, I don't think I even need to reiterate, look at the grip this Pirelli Slick has. That's crazy. I'm pulling on that pretty hard. You'd think that tire would be spinning on top of that stand right now. Make sure you got them all good and even, which I have. Okay, let's go ahead and put the rear wheel in. Don't be too judgmental. This is my very first time. You're going to see that. So if I struggle with it, you can all laugh at me later. Remember, the thing I am most concerned with is that rear wheel speed sensor and contact between it and any sharp edges that are on that uh, rotor that could damage it. Okay, so that's good. The caliper pistons, uh, brake pads, there's plenty of gap there. Got that slit in there. Okay, got that dipped in there. And from here, we'll just go ahead and raise the wheel up a little bit using the thumb screw on that tire wedge to help me out. You can see the calipers there in the hanger, no problem. That all looks pretty good, man. Pretty much right there now. I'm gonna show you a little trick that I like to use. That was not horrible for the first time. I feel pretty good about that. Little Maxima MPPL on our rear axle. You always wanna make sure that rear axle is well lubricated. It's an opportunity to kind of clean it off and lubricate it all at the same time. And we'll slide that through. That makes it go through a whole lot easier. So realistically with each tire change, it's not a bad idea to just take the opportunity. Thin film. If you want to use axle grease or something, that's up to you. It's just a whole bunch messier. This stuff is Tremendous lubricant. Get your axle block adjuster in there. Washer back in place. Nut. You know, for right now, you know, we still have the, the stock wheelbase on it. Just gonna snug that up just a little bit. At least we know it'll be nice and even. Give us kind of a nice little starting point here. And then we'll go up and work on the front sprocket. Okay, front sprocket. We get this question all the time. You know, oftentimes people are like, well, shouldn't the logo or the numbers always be facing out? That is in fact not always the case. Okay, so here's how you do this. This is the position it was on from the factory. I'm gonna go ahead and slide it off. There's the back side. Okay. I want you to set that on a flat surface. The most important thing is the gap from the table or the flat surface to the beginning of the teeth. You need to make sure that this gap is the same with the new sprocket. So in the case of this one, that is going to have the shoulder facing the motorcycle. And they made this, this sprocket was made specifically for this bike. They had to make a new front sprocket for the Gixxer 1017 and up. So that's why the shoulder, the logo, and the part number, all that stuff lines up. So with any other bike, that's how you do that. And now you're gonna ask, well, what if my motorcycle is dished, the sprocket's dished on the other side? Then what I like to do is I'll grab a socket, okay, that basically fits inside here, and I'll set this on top of the sprocket, on, on top of the socket, I'll take a measurement to the beginning of these teeth, 
and then I will use the same socket, remove this, put the 520 sprocket on top, and find which side gets me to the same distance from the table to the beginning of the teeth. So great rule to follow, and that answers that question. So for this motorcycle, we're going to install shoulder facing the counter shaft. Just like that real tight tolerance there. We then have the washer, factory washer. Okay, and this is a locking nut. They did also use Loctite on here, okay? That is up to you, what you want, how you want to proceed. If you want to use some thread locker, do that. Obviously, they used a real high strength thread locker here. Then go ahead and get that out now if you want to use that to install your front sprocket. Okay, if you're wondering, yeah, I used an impact to tighten it up, okay? But that's personal choice stuff. Do what feels right for you. Now we've got our front sprocket on, okay? It's lined up correctly, so the plane that the teeth begin at is going to be identical with the rear sprocket. That's the most important thing. That driveline angle is really important. Okay, now we're ready for our chain. Both sprockets are on. If you remember, from the factory, 120 links is what was used. The gearing that I have on the motorcycle right now, the 41 tooth rear, there is a pretty strong possibility, even though I have right now a 120 link chain in my hands, there's a pretty strong chance that I'm gonna have to cut this thing, okay, because of those four teeth in the rear. So let's go ahead and get it all wound through the swing arm over the sprockets, and then we'll discover if we need to cut the chain. And what you can do from here to assist you with this is we'll open the rivet link now. I'm not going to lubricate it. I'm literally just going to use it to hold the chain together while I make a decision on length. Because this is really important. When you cut it, you're committed to it, and that's the end of it. If you've cut it too short, well, that's a bummer. Okay. Grab a hold of the wheel, see if we can bring the axle back at all. and loosen that up just a little bit. That's all the way back in the adjustment, and that's really not where I want it. I think I want it much closer to where it was from the factory, okay, in terms of wheelbase. So clearly, we're gonna need to cut this. Okay, so from here, we'll pull out that rivet link that I just have loosely in there holding it. And we'll try to find the best possible place to cut this. This is a big decision right here. So, if I cut it and I take out just these two links here, because remember, I have to have male, male ends of the chain. So I'd have to cut right here. Man, that's going to be pretty darn close. I'd actually be able to bring the axle a little further back in the adjustment. So we're gonna start there and see how that lines up. We'll use the same tool to break this chain that we did the OE. Okay, so 118 links is where we've ended up. With this, and I just talked to Chris Ulrich, the team owner, they are able to use, with the 16 tooth front sprocket, a 41, a 42, or a 43 tooth rear sprocket. The goal too, oftentimes, especially on a thousand, like I said, is to get that that swing arm, that wheelbase, spread it out a little bit, okay? It's gonna help you get that power to the ground and keep the front wheel down, which when you're racing is most appropriate. So now we're at a point where we know this is gonna work and we want to rivet this link. So we're gonna pull it back out and prep this to do just that. The chain, of course, comes with one rivet link. We're gonna go ahead and put 
two seals on this side. It comes with chain loop, assembly loop to get this all put together. You got to cut this open. I must have just missed it. We'll put just a little coating on each one of the seals. That's pretty important. Let them to start off life well lubricated. This stuff is the greatest too. I love getting this all over my fingers. And then we're going to take and we're going to make sure we have a good amount of lube inside the actual holes that this rivet link is going to push through. Okay? So, push it in like that. And we'll do the same on the other end. Coat the outside. Like so. Take that rivet link. And I like to put my thumb over and then push. And what that does is that forces that lube to disperse much more evenly. Pull the axle forward just a little bit here. It's gonna help me get this chain back together. I had to slide the axle forward a little bit. Uh, let's get this started. You can see that kind of peeking through. Thumb over it and push. You feel a little pressure. And it just helps disperse that nice and evenly. Okay, now we gotta get the other two seals. Nice coating of chain wax in that, it's no problem. Now I got that stuff everywhere. Okay, once you've done that, you can then get the new plate and push it over. You know, the whole rivet link thing, this can be challenging, okay? It's oftentimes not a bad idea, if you haven't done this a lot, to purchase additional links in case you think you're going to have a problem, okay? Okay, we've shown you guys this a number of times and we'll do it again here. Right now, what we need to do is we need to get that plate pressed on far enough so that we have enough of the rivet ends poking through the side plate so that we can go ahead and peen them over using this very same tool, okay? In order to do that, you need to pull the block out and put it on the actual drive screw itself. You'll then line up the tool with the plate at the back side of the chain. Definitely take your time here. Get everything lined up nicely. There's a handle we're gonna install on the tool right now that I didn't use previously. It's gonna help us stabilize it, get a little more torque. Seventeen mil wrench. And you can see through here the progress that you're making. Important that you don't overdo this step. So you'll notice I'm kind of taking the opportunity to look at it multiple times. I'll loosen it up now, take a look, and you can see we're just starting to peek through, okay? Give you a look at that again. If there's any point within this job where you're just going to slow down, pump the brakes, take a breath, this is the right place, okay? So take your time. Don't be afraid to pull the tool back off. Have a second, third, fourth look. And notice how I'm rocking this continually too. If you get it too tight, you're gonna find a lot of resistance when you go to rotate that back and forth. Go ahead and take a look again. I 
Okay, I like that. And now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna go and spread the head of the rivet so that the master link can't come off. This is equally as important as the step that we just showed you. If you over compress here, you're gonna destroy it. Okay, so take your time. You don't need to wrench this all down at once. Using the same tool, we wanna rotate it until the R is lined up with the main body of the tool, right there. We also need to use this. This is what is going to peen over and spread that rivet. Back it out enough. Definitely wanna make sure this is lubricated. We've got plenty of chain lube on here. To do that, there's a hole in the back of the tool on that block that lines up with the back portion of that rivet. So all the force is now on that rivet. Get that ball bearing on this portion of the tool lined up at the center of that rivet. And we're going to go ahead and begin compressing it. Just like I showed you on the other stuff. Baby steps, man. Baby steps. The chain, you're going to notice it when you open it up. There's not a whole bunch of instructions here that tell you how to do this and show you what the spec is. This stuff is typically not broadcast. So what I do is I like to get it spread out pretty close to the other links. And I'll just continue to do it in stages. Very small movements, constantly double checking, making sure everything's going smoothly. If you do it this way, you dramatically reduce the possibility of destroying that rivet link. Okay, rivet link is good. Remember, once again, let's check this, man. That drag's gotta be really close. That feels good, no binding. None of the seals are pushed out, so we're good to go back there. Now it's time to come back and adjust our chain tension. 10 to 12 wrench on this bike. Loosen it up on each side. We know that they were even before, so we're gonna try and keep it relatively close by using equal turns. Go about three like that. Do the same here on the other side. We'll just keep double checking until we get it to a nice even point. Okay, come over to the other side. Yep, we've still got a ways to go. From here I do have my Motion Pro tools that we're gonna use to get our chain tension and our drivetrain alignment set up. You know, we are definitely getting close. Remember on this bike, spec is 30 to 20 millimeters. Uh, we've got our chain alignment tool from Motion Pro. We also have that slack setter. It's gonna help us set the slack. Our first concern now is gonna be making sure the axle is even as possible, okay? A great way to do that is gonna be to use that chain alignment tool. The axle adjuster blocks and the marks on the swing arm, that's a great place to start. I've got those really even right now. So I just use that wrench to help force the axle adjuster blocks against the adjuster screws. It's probably a little bit to the loose side right now, but that's okay. Let's go ahead and get this tool up here. Drive line friction eats power. Okay, so let's get that installed on a nice flat spot on the sprocket, and then I need to come to the back of the bike and shoot a straight line here. Okay, and that actually looks really good. Chain alignment looks good right now, so let's go ahead and use the slack setter, and let's see where we're at. 
in terms of chain slack. We're going to be pretty darn close. Okay, we are towards the top end of the scale right now. Just short of 30. And that is the place where I want to start, is right there. I definitely don't want to be out of spec, but being on the road racing course, I like to have it towards the higher end, so more towards 30 than I would towards 20. So right now we're going to focus on the actual alignment of the drivetrain itself. Okay, so once again, drivetrain alignment, chain alignment. I like where the slack's at, we're good. I use a flashlight now, just really helps me see exactly where that mark is in relationship to the axle block adjuster on both sides. And I gotta tell you right now, this thing is bang on. Those are even, and when I get my sight line with this Motion Pro tool, boy, I gotta tell you, that looks super straight. I dig it, I like where it's at. We're gonna roll with this right now, okay? That looks good. Drivetrain alignment is huge. If it's out of alignment, you're just what you're robbing power. You're going to be hard on the chain and sprockets. You don't want that. It's also important to understand too that just millimeters, tiny, tiny little increments, you, you can see how that chain is able to slide back and forth on that sprocket. Okay, same thing in the front. That little bit of slack that allows for it to move around just a little bit. So while you want to be very accurate here, using a tool like this where you have a sight line and then of course relying on the marks on the swing arm, that is gonna get you really, really close, close enough that you're gonna remove all of the bad driveline misalignment for sure. Okay, this bike should ride really well right now. Slack is set. We need to make sure that we torque the jam nuts, get our axle torqued. Once again, before I do the axle torque, I'm gonna put that wrench in there. I like to roll it back and this puts a lot of pressure on the axle, which then pushes the adjuster blocks against the adjusters firmly. Okay, so I'm doing that, torqued my axle. Now, and you can clearly see that screw is tight because I put a lot of pressure on that. Let's get our jam nut there. Hold the 10, and you want to try and do this so that you're not allowing that adjuster screw to rotate at all when you tighten the jam nut. Okay, so I'm holding that in a fixed position and I'm tightening the jam nut. You definitely do not want this jam nut to come loose. Very important step here. I'll repeat that process on the other side. So, 